This is one of the nation's best sellers, first printed on September 27, 1962. Up to now, 500,000 copies have been sold, and Silent Spring has been called the most controversial book of the year. Biologist Rachel Carson, who also wrote The Sea Around Us, worked four years in the preparation of Silent Spring. What she wrote started a national quarrel. Chemicals are the sinister and little recognized partners of radiation in changing the very nature of the world, the very nature of its life. Since the mid-1940s, over 200 basic chemicals have been created for use in killing insects, weeds, rodents, and other organisms described in the modern vernacular as pests. And they are sold under several thousand different brand names. These sprays, dusts, and aerosols are now applied almost universally to farms, gardens, forests, and homes. Non-selective chemicals that have the power to kill every insect, the good and the bad, to still the song of birds and the leaping of fish in the streams, to coat the leaves with a deadly film, and to linger on in soil. All this, though the intended target may be only a few weeds or insects. Can anyone believe it is possible to lay down such a barrage of poisons on the surface of the earth without making it unfit for all life? They should not be called insecticides, but biocides. A spokesman for the chemical industry, Dr. Robert White Stevens. The major claims in Miss Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, are gross distortions of the actual facts, completely unsupported by scientific experimental evidence and general practical experience in the field. Her suggestion that pesticides are in fact biocides destroying all life is obviously absurd in the light of the fact that without selective biological activity these compounds would be completely useless. The real threat then to the survival of man is not chemical but biological in the shape of hordes of insects that can denude our forests, sweep over our croplands, ravage our food supply and leave in their wake a train of destitution and hunger conveying to an undernourished population the major diseases and scourges of mankind. If man were to faithfully follow the teachings of Miss Carson, we would return to the Dark Ages, and the insects and diseases and vermin would once again inherit the Earth. CBS reports, the silent spring of Rachel Carson. Here is CBS News correspondent, Eric Severide. Good evening. We are living in what has been called the synthetic age, the age of the atom, the missile, the frozen TV dinner. In the next hour, you will hear that this is also the age of the wormless apple and the calculated risk. Miss Rachel Carson and those who agree with her charge that risks involved in the use of chemical pesticides far exceed the benefits they provide, including wormless apples. In the heat of this controversy, one is reminded of Abraham Lincoln's first words to Harriet Beecher Stowe. So you're the little lady who wrote the book that made this great war. Sit down, please. Tonight we shall sit down in an attempt to examine a controversy and a problem that begins here with the insect. Damage caused by pests in this country alone, an estimated $14 billion a year. We compete for our food with about 3,000 different species of insects. Some, carrying disease, attack man directly. The insects were here perhaps 400 million years before man arose. And some scientists believe that because of their strength and adaptability, they will be here 400 million years after man vacates. It is said that their inheritance of the earth, if it comes, could result from a few false moves on the part of man. Today, man's defense rests primarily on chemical poisons. Brewed in flasks and test tubes, synthetic organic pesticides are the major weapon. Dr. Robert White Stevens, assistant to the director of research, American Cyanamid Company, explained these chemicals to producer Jay McMullen. Uh, organic pesticides are simply those compounds which contain carbon and synthetic organic pesticides are compounds which have been synthesized by the chemist in the laboratory. 
uh, taking fragments of various other uh, substances and putting them together into a new molecular configuration. The total number of pesticide formulations registered for sale, 55,500. They come in insecticides, fumicides, fungicides, nematicides, rodenticides, and herbicides. We are told, conquer crabgrass and kill lawn insects with one easy application. Put the squeeze on garden insects and plant disease. Kills aphids, Japanese beetles, mites, thrips, earwigs, and tent caterpillars. Any time is spray time. According to the National Academy of Sciences, 28% of our cropland under cultivation is sprayed each year with pesticides. The country's total amount of land treated with pesticides is estimated at more than 194 million acres. The use of pesticides is defended by industry, government, and many farmers for reasons you are about to hear. First, the Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Luther Terry, on pesticides and human health. Pesticides have contributed considerably, I would say greatly, to health in this country. An example in this direction, I think, is the control of malaria, which has been made possible in this country by the use of pesticides, insecticides. For instance, back in 1935, we had over 150,000 cases of malaria in the United States. Today, we have virtually none, and the few cases that are seen are usually brought in from abroad. Also, in terms of control of many other diseases, including uh, encephalitis, murine typhus fever, and many others. I think that uh, one should appreciate that, though it has been of considerable importance in this country, uh, worldwide, the use of insecticides and pesticides in the control of human disease have been probably of even greater significance. The United States Department of Agriculture also defends the use of pesticides. Secretary of Agriculture, Orville Freeman. Without the use of some of uh, these controllants, uh, some of these pesticides and some of these uh, chemicals of various kinds, why we would have, have uh, let us say, where food and agricultural production is concerned, if not insect ascendancy, at least uh, insect uh, equality, and we'd be moving on the down, not the upside. Many of the new synthetic chemicals are highly toxic contact poisons. Inhalation or a few drops on the skin may cause human illness or death. But we are told... When pesticides, registered pesticides, are used in accordance with label instructions and recommendations, then there is no danger to either man or to animals and wildlife. Many of these chemicals are sprayed on our food crops, and tolerances or tiny residues of 127 different pesticides are permitted by law to be present on the food we eat. Are these residues safe? George Larry, Commissioner, United States Food and Drug Administration. I do not know of any human injuries caused by an amount of pesticide on a food product which did not exceed the tolerance. Even though a substance may be toxic or very poisonous in a certain amount, as pesticides are, in smaller amounts, uh, it can be used safely. Is that the general principle? Then? Yes, they're not. I wouldn't say they are all very toxic. They run the gamut from relatively safe ones to very toxic ones, but the tolerances are all based on the principle that you've just stated. The maximum pesticide residues permitted on the food we eat are 100 times smaller than the amount fed with no sign of ill effects to a generation of laboratory animals. Dr. Wayland Hayes, toxicologist, Public Health Service. There's no evidence that the small doses of pesticides that we do get are causing any harm. The only effect that can be measured objectively is the storage of one of them, DDT, in the tissues of most people. The amount stored in ordinary people who eat ordinary food and have no occupational exposure is less than 10 parts per million. This storage uh, has not caused any injury that we can detect. Up to now, we have presented only one side of the pesticide controversy, but there is more to be said. Miss Rachel Carson. We've heard the benefits of pesticides. We have heard um, a great deal about their safety, but very little about 
the hazards, very little about the failures, the inefficiencies. And yet the public was being asked to accept these chemicals, was being asked to acquiesce in their use, and did not have the whole picture. So I set about to remedy the, the balance there. Excerpts of Miss Carson's remedy, Silent Spring, first appeared in the New Yorker magazine on June 16, 1962. Then Houghton Mifflin Company published a complete text and Rachel Carson's attack was launched. Chapter two, the obligation to endure. It is not my contention that chemical insecticides must never be used. I do contend that we have put poisonous and biologically potent chemicals indiscriminately into the hands of persons largely or wholly ignorant of their potentials for harm. I contend furthermore that we have allowed these chemicals to be used with little or no advance investigation of their effect on soil, water, wildlife, and man himself. Chapter 6, The Earth's Green Mantle. Many herbs, shrubs, and trees of forests and range depend on native insects for their reproduction. Without these plants, many wild animals and range stock would find little food. Now, clean cultivation and the chemical destruction of hedgerows and weeds are eliminating the last sanctuaries of these pollinating insects and breaking the threads that bind life to life. Chapter 7, Needless Havoc. We poison the caddis flies in a stream and the salmon runs dwindle and die. We poison the gnats in a lake and the poison travels from link to link of the food chain and soon the birds of the lake margins become its victims. We spray our elms and the following springs are silent of robin song, not because we sprayed the robins directly, but because the poison traveled step by step through the now familiar elm leaf earthworm robin cycle. When the public protests, confronted with some obvious evidence of damaging results of pesticide applications, it is fed little tranquilizing pills of half-truth. We urgently need an end to these false assurances, to the sugar coating of unpalatable facts. Chapter 16, The Rumblings of an Avalanche. Spraying kills off the weaklings. Inevitably, it follows that intensive spraying with powerful chemicals only makes worse the problem it is designed to solve. The list of resistant species now includes all the insect groups of medical importance. Beyond the dreams of the Borgias. So thoroughly has the age of poisons become established that anyone may walk into a store and without questions being asked, buy substances of far greater death-dealing power than the medicinal drug for which he may be required to sign a poison book in the pharmacy next door. In river or lake or reservoir, or for that matter in the glass of water served at your dinner table, are mingled chemicals that no responsible chemist would think of combining in his laboratory. And there are so-called tolerances which permit small residues of most of these chemicals to occur on food. The human price. Little is said about the hazards of the fad of gardening by poisons or of insecticides used in the home. The sudden illness or death of farmers, spraymen and others exposed to appreciable quantities of pesticides are tragic and should not occur. But for the population as a whole, we must be more concerned with the delayed effects of absorbing small amounts of the pesticides that invisibly contaminate our world. We have to remember that children born today are exposed to these chemicals from birth, perhaps even before birth. Now what is going to happen to them in adult life as a result of that exposure? We simply don't know because we've never before had this kind of experience. Now we know from experiments on animals that many of these chemicals accumulate in body tissues. We know that some are liver poisons, others are nerve poisons, and for still others we have evidence that they produce mutations 
and in various other ways are exceedingly dangerous materials. Now, all of these things, even any one of them together would be ample cause for caution, but I think added together, they mean that unless we do bring these chemicals under better control, we are certainly headed for disaster. Silent Spring became the Book of the Month Club selection for October. Naturalist and Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas said, Silent Spring is the most important chronicle of this century for the human race. The New York Times reported, the men who make the pesticides are crying foul and companies are preparing briefs in defense of their products. Now, although there are a number of scientific errors, misquotations, and obvious misinterpretations in her book, it must be admitted that much of her material is, in part at least, scientifically accurate. The area of disagreement between Miss Carson and students of applied agricultural chemistry, however, will lie in her clearly misplaced emphasis. She discounts and deliberately depreciates all those safety measures which research laboriously has developed and built into each new agricultural chemical that emerges, while she concomitantly bills the possible and alleged hazards of these compounds to horrible and simply staggering dimensions. Time magazine agreed. It called Miss Carson's book an emotional and inaccurate outburst. But the majority of magazines and newspaper reviews and editorials were favorable. A New York Times editorial suggested that Miss Carson would be as deserving of the Nobel Prize as was the inventor of DDT if her book helps to arouse enough public concern to immunize government agencies against the blandishments of the hucksters and enforces adequate controls. Silent Spring did have an impact in Washington. At the Food and Drug Administration, Commissioner George Lerick said, I think very definitely it had an impact on the Food and Drug Administration. I think it causes all of us to take a new look at, at our responsibilities uh, to, the, to the general public. At the Department of Agriculture, Secretary Freeman. Let's say the book, I believe, will have helped the American people in alerting them uh, that we need to do more work, but we also need to be personally conscious. This is like anything else. The government isn't going to do it for you. Somebody else isn't going to do it for you. You're basically going to have to do it for yourself. And that means to protect yourself, and that means to see to it that your government protects you where you can't protect yourself. During the past years, do you think that the public was sufficiently appraised uh, of the potential hazards of pesticides? The answer I could say very quickly is no. At his press conference on August 29th, 1962, President Kennedy was asked, there appears to be growing concern among scientists as to the possibility of dangerous long-range side effects from the widespread use of DDT and other pesticides. Have you considered asking the Department of Agriculture or the Public Health Service to take a closer look at this? Yes, I, 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 and I know that they uh, already are. I think particularly, of course, uh, since Ms. Carson's book, but uh, they are examining the matter. The next day, the administration announced that the government pesticide program would be reviewed by the Federal Council on Science and Technology and by a panel of the President's Science Committee. CBS reports the silent spring of Rachel Carson will continue. Charges and countercharges had been made, but the glare of controversy tended to obscure acknowledgement on all sides that a pesticide problem does exist. How serious this problem may be is at issue. We shall attempt now to present some facts pertinent to the issue which are not disputed. First, according to the Public Health Service, at least 150 persons die in this nation every year as a result of acute pesticide poisoning. But a tabulation of deaths from pesticides has not been made since 1956, seven years ago. The total number of injuries or illnesses caused by pesticides each year is unknown. Last year, California reported 850 workers injured through the use of pesticides. Occasional careless use of pesticides on food crops also has resulted in acute poisoning of consumers. George Lerick, Commissioner, Food and Drug Administration. We have had instances of acute poisoning where somebody would use an unauthorized amount, very greatly exceeding the tolerance, or use a pesticide on a crop where they were not authorized to use it at all. And in those instances, we have had uh, acute poisoning episodes. Fortunately, these instances are, are rare, but they're the sort of thing that 
we've all got to watch out for with great care. Do they uh, bring nightmares to the uh, Food and Drug Administration, thoughts of this kind? Well, they, they bring great concern, I, I will assure you. I, I, have, I don't think, uh, in all honesty, that the controls that we're able to exercise today are truly sufficient in the light of the growing technology and the growing use of pesticides in this field. Would part of uh, the reason for that be the use of widespread spraying, for example, from airplanes? Yes. Because of air drift and wind changes, as much as 80% of a pesticide sprayed from a plane may miss the target. And according to government experts, on occasion, this has caused an unauthorized contamination of food crops or animal fodder. It is also conceded that the use of pesticides has resulted in some damage to fish and wildlife. Speaking for industry, Dr. White Stevens. It is to be admitted that in certain cases, uh, the use of pesticides on a large scale have reduced certain species of our wildlife in those areas. However, in general, the wildlife has quickly recovered and the impact of uh, these pesticides upon wildlife is really quite insignificant. Dr. John Buckley, Director, United States Fish and Wildlife Research Center. I think there is no doubt that the use of pesticides has resulted in extensive damage to wildlife. We can't measure this on a continent-wide basis, but wherever we have conducted careful studies, we have had losses that averaged 80% or more. Could any of this damage have been avoided? I think that some of this damage could have been avoided, but there's a great deal of this which was uh, the result of carefully carried out programs and given the present methods and materials that we have, uh, it could not have been avoided. On the other hand, uh, some of it certainly was the result of accident or the result of miscalculation, where we plan not to treat uh, so close to streams as we in fact did treat uh, other things of this sort. That our water contains pesticides also is uncontested. Pesticide water pollution studies are being conducted by Dr. Paige Nicholson of the United States Public Health Service. We've learned that pesticides can be flushed off the land following intense thunder showers in sufficient quantities to destroy aquatic life. This is usually made obvious by floating dead fish in the vicinity. We've also learned that pesticides can be leached off the soil over considerable periods of time in sublethal quantities. This has uh, been observed more or less year-round in our study areas. Are we routinely ingesting pesticides in our drinking water? In some instances, yes. Well, have you found in drinking water any pesticide whose residue is not permitted on food crops because that residue is considered to be too toxic for human ingestion? We have found one insecticide belonging to the chlorinated hydrocarbon group. Are there any indications that there may be other pesticides in this class that are also in our water? There may be, but we've made no survey of the field to determine this. The Food and Drug Administration prohibits any pesticide residues in milk because milk may be the main diet of infants and, of course, be ingested every day. Does the Public Health Service have any regulations limiting pesticide residues in water? No, it does not. That in milk, one insecticide has been found occasionally, also is a fact. George Larrick, Commissioner, United States Food and Drug Administration. There are, there are extremely minute traces of DDT found occasionally in, in milk, but those amounts are almost down to the infinite in, in the quantity. But we have never set a tolerance for DDT in milk, and our objective is to keep pesticides generally out of milk, which has a very special status in our food supply as a food for babies. That in the fat or tissues of fish, wildlife, and man, there may be an accumulation and storage of some pesticide residues is not contested. Dr. Wayland Hayes, toxicologist, Public Health Service. All chemicals that are absorbed are stored to some extent, but some of them are excreted very rapidly. Now, all of the chlorinated hydrocarbon insecticides are stored for a long while. 
that pesticide storage has adversely affected the growth and reproduction of pheasants, ducks, and some other game birds also is a fact recently established. Dr. Buckley of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. We have found a reduction in the number of eggs laid, a reduction of the fertility of the eggs that are laid, a reduction in the number that hatch from these which were fertile, a reduction in the number of viable chicks that are produced uh, from the eggs that do hatch, and lastly, an increased percentage of cripples among the uh, young which do hatch. In this case, uh, not only does it affect reproduction, but if you'll notice these pheasants here, this is a normal male pheasant. You can see the white band on the neck. This is a male pheasant whose diet included about 125 parts per million of one of the chlorinated hydrocarbons. This male has none of the normal plumage characteristics that you find in the normal male pheasant. Uh, this, you notice, has plumage which is typically that of the female. And one other thing I should point out on this too, uh, that is that the levels that do this are much below the level which will produce death. And this is true not alone of the insecticides, but also this is true of some of our common herbicides uh, where at levels uh, as low as a fourth that necessary to kill will uh, adversely affect the ability to reproduce. Finally, what has happened to the insects? More than 137 different species of insects have become resistant to some insecticides. This is the reason for producing new chemicals each year to which the insects are not resistant. J. McMullen asked Dr. White Stevens, why is it necessary to produce pesticides that are a potential hazard to people? Well, of course, the problem is that we have to kill the insect. We do everything we possibly can to produce compounds which are toxic to insects, but not particularly toxic to animals. This is a very difficult thing to do because living processes are fairly common to all creatures. Carson contends that pesticide chemicals are used without sufficient knowledge of their effects on man and his environment. Yet according to industry, each new pesticide that reaches the market undergoes some three to five years of experimentation, costing as much as two and a half million dollars. Pilot field tests must prove the pesticide's utility to the Department of Agriculture. The Food and Drug Administration must review all experimental data on animal tests and certify that the pesticide can be used safely if label directions are followed. Despite all this, do we know enough about the effects of pesticides? McMullen question, Dr. Paige Nicholson, water pollution expert, Public Health Service. Do you know how long the pesticides persist in the water once they get into it? Not entirely. Do you know the extent to which our groundwater may be contaminated right now by pesticides? We don't know that either, nor do we know if concentration may be occurring in groundwater. Do you know the effect of long-term exposure of pesticides on aquatic life? Not completely. Do you know how pesticides may interreact within water organisms? This, too, is uh, an area where we need to know more. What remains to be known about the effects of pesticides on birds and other wildlife? Dr. John Buckley, Director, United States Fish and Wildlife Research Center. Proportionally, we've, we've just barely made a dent in, uh, in this whole field of knowledge. Uh, we've examined something like 60 compounds out of the several hundred that are in common use. We've examined their effects on not many more than a dozen species, and yet there are well over a thousand species of birds alone, uh, well, birds and mammals that we're concerned with. There are many kinds of fish that we're concerned with, and yet it's only a few of these that we've looked at at all. In addition, we'd like to know the levels of, of residues of most of the common pesticides throughout the, the total environment. And we find them on birds, for example, taken from almost any place. And it's most unusual to find a fish sample from any place. It doesn't contain a detectable residue. We need to know the rate at which uh, these are taken up, the rate at which they're eliminated, the length of time that they stay, the part of the organism that they affect, whether they, for example, we find concentrations of, of certain of these in, in the brain tissue, uh, in liver tissue, in the testes, uh, in the breast muscle, uh, just widely scattered uh, through the animal, uh, largely uh, tied up in the uh, fats of the animal uh, wherever they may be. Do you need to know then how these uh, concentrations affect these particular organs, the brain, the liver? 
Yes, we need to know the effects of these, these compounds on each of these organs, or the, conversely, the lack of effect. But we need to know what, we need to answer the question, so what, when we find this material here? What does it mean? And this, uh, this I don't think we know well for any compound in any individual bird. Finally, how does ingestion and long-term storage of pesticides affect the human body? Only a few human experiments have been made. Dr. Luther Terry, Surgeon General, United States Public Health Service. One of the things that has caused considerable concern to us with relation to insecticides and pesticides is the question of what happens with low-level, long-range exposure of human beings to these substances. And uh, the question is, for instance, with the chlorinated hydrocarbons, when they do accumulate in the fat of man, does this do any harm? At what level uh, much, must the accumulation reach to uh, be harmful to man's health? Earlier in this program, a public health service toxicologist stated, there is no evidence that the small doses of pesticides we get are causing harm. But is there no evidence as a result of investigation? Or is there no evidence because no investigation has been made? The total number of pesticides studied by the Public Health Service for cumulative effects on humans, three. In Silent Spring, Ms. Carson stresses the possibility that pesticide chemicals may be working harm in man in ways as yet undetected, perhaps contributing to cancer, leukemia, genetic damage. In the absence of proof, her critics concede that these are possibilities, but not probabilities, and they accuse Miss Carson of alarmism. Yet few scientists deny that some risk may be involved. Jay McMullen asked Dr. Hartjering, staff member of the President's Science Committee, if the growth and reproduction of wildlife is adversely affected by pesticides, may man also be affected in similar ways? The answer to this question is not easy. Uh, there is no direct relationship between wildlife and man. But there is an indirect relation, and to be prudent, we must assume that this reaction could be taking place in man, that there could be an effect on reproduction. Uh, we need to study this to determine whether, in fact, this is true or not. It is true that some pesticide residues on food, originally thought to be safe for human ingestion, later proved to be unsafe. Commissioner Larrick of the Food and Drug Administration. We discovered, for example, that certain class of pesticides had an adverse effect on what we call chlorinesterase, which is the chemical in the body that has to do with nerve impulses. And we discovered that this was an effect that was cumulative. If you had two of the chemicals of the same general class, you had perhaps more than double the harm. So we had to take that new fact into account and we stopped allowing any more tolerances with any of those till we had figured out that relationship. But fortunately, the action was taken before I think any harm was done to the public. The FDA also discovered through improved means of measurement that residues of some pesticides permitted on food crops for many years were in fact too toxic for human consumption. Still other pesticides were found to cause cancer in laboratory animals and were banned from further use on food. But the FDA admits that two pesticides presently permitted on food have caused tumors in experimental animals. At issue is whether or not any pesticide residues should be permitted on food sent to market. Here is Ms. Carson's recommendation. For some chemicals where small residues were permitted a few years ago, now, with increasing knowledge, it has been necessary to reduce the tolerance to zero. Now, in my feeling, if that can be done for some, it can be done for all. Jay McMullen put this question to Dr. Arnold Lehman, Chief Toxicologist, Food and Drug Administration. For some pesticides, you set a zero tolerance, meaning that no residue of those pesticides may be present on crops when they're marketed. Why not set zero tolerances for all pesticides? I wish I could answer that question in a happy mood, but I can't because the insects won't cooperate. Some insects wait until the crop is mature and then attack the mature crop. And nature provides the time of the appearance of the insects when their food crop is at its best. 
In other words, you might have to use a pesticide uh, very soon before the crop is being harvested because it's being attacked. That is right. Say. And consequently, then the pesticide residue will be on the crop. There's no way of getting rid of it. That's is that right. what you mean, sir? That is right. Interstate shipments of food containing pesticide residues, either unauthorized or exceeding the amount permitted by law, may be seized by inspectors of the Food and Drug Administration and destroyed. But are consumers adequately protected by the FDA? Ms. Carson. At the present time, the Food and Drug Administration is greatly overburdened. It has a very inadequate staff for checking the shipments that move from one state to another. Now, obviously, they need a great deal more money. They need a great deal, a great many more inspectors. FDA Commissioner George Lerick. We have been sampling about one-third of one percent of the shipments that move in interstate commerce this year. Congress has given us enough money so that we hope to sample 1% of the shipments, but I do not think that's enough. Another recommendation that I feel very strongly about is that we should have legislation requiring that these pesticide chemicals be thoroughly tested for a genetic effect before they're put on the market. Now, we certainly have had tragic warning in the recent months that drugs can cause serious malformations and other defects in generations yet unborn. Now, pesticides may well have the same effect. Dr. Lehman of the Food and Drug Administration. I have talked to geneticists about this problem, and in order to establish a genetic effect, they tell me that the test must go through at least 20 generations. Now, man's generation is about 25 years. So that would take 500 years to test it on man. You don't have to test these on generations of human beings. You can test them on laboratory animals, the same sort of organisms that have been used successfully for many years to determine genetic effect. In spite of her view that present pesticide safeguards are inadequate, Ms. Carson does not advocate discontinuing the use of pesticides immediately. Instead, she proposes a gradual shift to other methods of pest control. We must go on to think in terms of other methods of control, of much more scientific, much more accurate and precise methods. And these do lie in the field of biological controls. Speaking for industry, Dr. White Stevens. The trouble with biological control is that it's far too specific one predator eating only one insect when it should we need to control 20 on a given crop it is usually too late the predator doesn't arrive until such time as the pest has already ravaged the crop this isn't just a matter of setting the insects to eating each other as many people suppose um, biological controls might involve something like sterilizing large numbers of the insect that you desire to be rid of. These sterile males will then mate with the wild insects and in time compete so successfully that the population will be wiped out. It might mean also the use of natural secretions of the insects as lures which would draw them perhaps into traps containing poisons. All of these methods are being experimented with, some with a great deal of promise. Jay McMullen asked Secretary of Agriculture Orville Freeman, are you in favor of more research in the field of biological controls? Yes, indeed. I think this is the direction in which it should move and the direction in which it is increasingly moving. How much money is the Department of Agriculture spending annually for biological control? Well, in the biological and environmental control area, uh, we are presently spending about a million and a half dollars a year uh, in research. This figure compares with the two million dollar figure, which uh, industry says it costs them to produce just one pesticide. Are you asking for uh, more funds for biological control? Well, we're moving, we're asking for all the funds that we can effectively use in this area and giving it very, very strong emphasis. 
there's a good deal of pioneering research going forward, and uh, we are continuing to give it very strong emphasis. The research, insofar as pesticides are concerned, the money for that comes from industry. The money for biological control must come from whom? Must come from the taxpayer. Producer reporter Jay McMullen spent eight months investigating the issues involved in the pesticide problem. This report continues in his words. Eight months ago, we set out to determine just how serious the pesticide problem really is. In that attempt, we have failed. Without sufficient facts, there can be no meaningful conclusion. To review, on this report, scientist after scientist has pointed to an appalling scarcity of facts concerning the effects of pesticides on man and his environment. You have heard that statistics on fatalities or non-fatal accidents or illnesses caused by pesticides are either non-existent or incomplete. What about the cumulative and long-range effects of pesticides? Are these chemicals causing genetic damage or contributing to cancer or leukemia? Without research, there is no evidence. Without evidence, there is no answer. Should we be alarmed when the commissioner of the United States Food and Drug Administration states flatly, as he did on this program, that pesticide controls are inadequate? Should we be alarmed that we are ingesting some pesticides that have affected reproduction or caused tumors in laboratory animals? We don't know the answers to these questions. Eight months ago, the President's Science Committee began its investigation. But up to now, no report has been issued. And CBS News has learned that dissension among government agencies is delaying that report. In Silent Spring, Ms. Carson said, It is the public that is being asked to assume the risks that the insect controllers calculate. The public must decide whether it wishes to continue on the present road. And it can do so only when in full possession of the facts. In the words of Jean Rostand, the obligation to endure gives us the right to know. Finally, it would seem that the basic arguments between Miss Carson and her critics transcend the specific pesticide issue, for they involve a conflict of attitude toward man's role in his environment and his attempts to control and manipulate nature for his own benefit. Dr. White Stevens. The crux, the fulcrum over which the argument chiefly rests is that Miss Carson maintains that the balance of nature is a major force in the survival of man, whereas the modern chemist, the modern biologist, the modern scientist believes that man is steadily controlling nature that he has already disrupted the balance of nature by his overburgeoning numbers, his cities and his airports and his roads and the way of his life. Now, uh, to these people, apparently the, the balance of nature was something that was um, repealed as soon as man came on the scene. Well, you might just as well assume that you could repeal the, the law of gravity. The balance of nature is built of a series of interrelationships between living things and between living things and their environment. You can't just step in with some brute force and change one thing without changing a good many others. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, that we must never interfere, that we must not attempt to tilt that balance of nature in our favor. But when we do make this attempt, we must know what we're doing. We must know the consequences. Man's attitude toward nature is today critically important, simply because we have now acquired a fateful power to alter and to destroy nature. But man is part of nature, and his war against nature is inevitably a war against himself. The rains have become an instrument to bring down from the atmosphere the deadly products of atomic explosions. Water, which is probably our most important natural resource, is now used and reused with incredible recklessness. Now, I, I truly believe that we in this generation must come to terms with nature. And I think we're challenged, as mankind has never been challenged before, to prove 
our maturity and our mastery, not of nature, but of ourselves. <laughs>